you as the consumer of the product of going to that club, you know, a middle class person is going to have a different set of demands and expectation than maybe a working class person. The working class person might not need the warm hellos and the welcome pack and all the stuff. Hello, Tommy. It's always a pleasure to have you. Um, how have you been? Um, very well, thank you, buddy. Very, very well indeed. Uh, how about yourself? I'm very good, although tired. Today, you're the third um, recording today, so a bit tired, <laughs> but very, very well. Um, how's the preparation for the fight? You're fighting in three days, if I've seen before. Yeah, I'm, fight I'm fighting Saturday night. Um, I have to say the preparation's not gone amazingly well. I've had to travel a lot for work. Um, like just not nearly been able to do enough sparring as I should and train. I still train a couple of times a week, but uh, I've not been able to do so at the normal frequency. But it'll be fine. It's three rounds, so it'll be fine. So wh why is it only three rounds? Is it like exhibition, or is it the rules for um, amateurs? Or it's, it's just because it's a it's a it's a local home show, so mm -hmm. there can be as many rounds as you like. But you've got a lot of fighters to fit into one evening. Um, you know mm -hmm. this. Day starts at like four o'clock. Children gets older and heavier, older and heavier. So if, if you were starting to do five, six, seven rounds, it'd just be t t too big and long of an event. Um, okay, well, so I was always thinking that you know, is ten rounds is minimum, but that's how ignorant I am. From no, so so like um, even down to so you know, professional fights. Most professional fights for the first. 50 60 or four rounds up to six you know like so even on say big shows I mean, this is a local show i'm doing but even on say a big televised show you know a lot of things are four five six rounds um mm. only when there's lots and lots of money involved does it start to go uh 10 12 rounds did you because you, you had a uh, chance I know that you said that you didn't have a chance to prepare yourself properly but then you had the chance to train in different um, gyms and with different coaches I've seen the video you're posting um, how was that experience because I know you love going and experiencing all this stuff yeah I, I, I'm really fortunate that I've got lots of friends and people I know that are good trainers and good training partners so wherever I'm training in the country I can usually find someone to uh, to do something with if i was working in guildford i'd come knocking on your door I'd be like les i got a fight in a couple of days let's do some stuff let's do some pads you know i think it's really important you just say hello to people and ask and most people are always really happy to help or do stuff with you um i've, I've never ever come across people saying oh they're too busy or they can't do something um so yeah it's cool every, every coach has got their own different style mm. um but some it's good also to pick up new stuff new tactics new strategies um i tend to because they're people that know me they tech that they know how i fight and how i move anyway so it's a bit easier than say complete strangers you know they know i'm south pole they know the kind of ranges that i like um but yeah i'm very very blessed to have lots of good friends all over the country that i can drop into with very little notice and do some stuff if i have to um obviously it's, it's nicer and more convenient to have a regular training camp and but you gotta you gotta do what you gotta do and i think it's always good people say you know it's, don't think of it as a fight camp just think of your entire life as a fight camp you know it's not mm -hmm. oh, i've only had six weeks or only had eight weeks you know you've had you know, 20 odd years <laughs> of, of, of stuff it all it all adds up yeah but it, as well in a kind of amateurs you don't have you don't know much about your opponent so there's no point having a camp that you're preparing for one one person you really don't know how they're going to be fighting if you don't know them right yeah exactly now i've seen the chap that i'm fighting because he's fought someone from my gym before so i've got a little bit more intelligence um and today's age as soon as you get someone's name if they put any fight of theirs on youtube you can find it pretty quickly anyway but it's not worth obsessing about it because you can watch someone fight on youtube or you can watch someone's competition and everybody looks really slow when you're not fighting. Like when you watch fighting and fighting's happening and you're here, everyone looks like, oh, I'd miss that. Do, do, you're like, oh, I'd do all these things. 
And as soon as you're in the ring or in the competition, you know, your perception of that speed and your perception of what you do completely changes. It's the same way when, when you do a competition and you think you've been pretty fast, and then you look back and you're like, who's that slow old bastard over there moving? <laughs> yes. yes uh, I, I was actually thinking that exactly what you said when we had that little sparring. And I thought, oh, yeah. he's so big, he's going to be slow. I'm going to go here, there. And then you're standing in there and that, that glove lands on your face. That's way faster than I've seen it on the videos. This is way, <laughs> way faster and it's heavier as well. <laughs> and, you know, that's... That's kind of learning through the practices, and then you can do as much um, boxing on a pad, as much sparring, friendly sparring with your um, partner who you know and you know what to expect. And when you step up even to a like a friendly sparring, and you don't know somebody, it's totally different experience, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It always takes people a little while to figure things out, get comfortable. And that's a good thing about a fight. It's not on long enough for people to get comfortable most times. Mm. So it's that's what makes them quite fun, that they're really unpredictable. If you've got a sparring partner you're always doing stuff with, you will always fall into a pattern or a routine, or um, it becomes a lot more give, take, give, take, which is also nice, but it's, you know, sparring strangers or people you haven't sparred with before, mm. That's that always unlocks little extra things that you you didn't know before or hadn't tried before which is cool yeah i love when people come into our dojo and and just just for that excitement that you don't know what's gonna happen how they're gonna move and what's gonna gonna do it's always a a good session just to um, yeah. test yourself and and test your friends and see your students especially how the students react as well so one of the best compliments i had from a german team who came to us and they said even your white belts you don't see fear they just go and spar because we're sparring on every session at least a half yeah. an hour right and they said wow how are you doing that that they are not having fear in their eyes you know white belt coming with the seventh done and and they just punch in the face right yeah and and and, and i think it's because uh, we do very friendly sparring so we, we are conscious about the injuries and brain injuries and we we below the boxing amateurs you know we're just doing it for as a hobbyist so we do very light sparring but even throwing that amount of rounds gets you that awareness that, you know, with the respectful people, you're not going to get really injured. Absolutely. You know, you always end up, you, you vary your pace, don't you? People that you know can take it a bit and, you know, you ramp it up and then you ramp it down. And then, you know, if you're, if you're a good, respectful partner, you, you can hit it just at the right note of enough contact to be meaningful, respectful mm. enough because you've still got half an hour of sparring. You know, you can... It's, it's beautiful when you get the right mix of people. You can do some really cool stuff. Mm. I was um, listening to your interview with your Spanish friend. Sorry, I'm terrible with names, so I can't remember his name. Um, yeah. And then, and then I was watching your take on uh, methodology in boxing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's quite very different because your friend is uh, promoting that. You know, you're both saying that boxing doesn't have a very, uh, how did you put it? Not intelligent, but educated coaches. They just get you on the, just do it and see how it goes instead of being overcoached like in karate, right? Yeah. But then your your Spanish friend saying that they're missing people a little bit more technical and kind of um, that coaching and guiding um, orientated. And that's why they are successful because they've got that martial art background and they bring in that coaching together. So which one is obviously, I think for you is the more crude uh, that I'm making air quotes here. Crude, yeah. crude way suits you better. I think that I've, that's my personal feeling. I think that it's it's by far and away a lot more common for most boxing clubs to be uh, absorption based coaching. So very little is said to you, unless you are a peak athlete. If you are if you are one of the main people that's going out every couple of weeks and doing their competitions, but if you're the average person going there, you're going to get very little guidance. You will learn. So, so when I'm very careful to say, you're not overtaught, mm -hmm. but that is also a good thing. In that, you know, you might only hear a couple of sentences in your first couple of months, but they're a really good set of sentences, <laughs> mm. um, as opposed to eight books worth of comment from that you might get from a martial arts instructor. You know, mm. I was um, martial arts. I think. Or I would often say are for middle class people. You know, 
middle class people, people with soft hands and that like to talk, debate, discuss. As a, as a rule, I would say if you were to take, take a cross section of a martial arts club and a cross section of a boxing club, most of the people at your boxing club are bricklayers, welders, gardeners, mechanics. You know, they're those types of people, those types of background. And then you might go to, say, your average Kung Fu or Karate club and you'll get accountants and managers. And, you know, it's, it's not it's not hard and fast and it changes everywhere around the world. Mm. But I'd say that, you know, you as the consumer of the product of going to that club, you know, a middle class person is going to have a different set of demands and expectation than maybe a working class person. The working class person might not need the warm hellos and the welcome pack and all the stuff. They just want to blast the bags and the pads and have a bit of sparring. Whereas Dave, the accountant, he might want, you know, where, what is this cutter? Where is it from? Yeah. And how does it work? What is the story of my suit? Why are the belts this color? You know, there's lots of, there's lots more chat. Um, mm. But again, it, it, obviously it all varies. I'm, talk, I'm talking generalizations here, but yeah, I'd say that in, in the main, the, the boxing teaching culture is you have a look, you have a go and you get refined. And the martial arts culture is we'll try and refine you really early and then it comes more personal afterwards. Mm. Um, but it's quite quite regimented and strict. This foot here, this hand here. Yeah. Mm. But again, they're all just different. Um, um, and I think Japanese go out there and say, um, in that a Japanese teaching culture is... It gets devolved to students really quickly. You're like, oh, well, you watch the purple belt and the purple belt watches the brown belt and the brown belt watches the first Dan and the first Dan watches the fifth Dan. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, I, I would feel cheated in a martial arts culture now, if I was honest. If I was to go to a club and then it's Wayne, the green belt, teaching me and not the instructor I'm paying, mm. you know, from my perspective, I'd be like, I'm not paying for Wayne, the green belt, I'm paying for you. <laughs> um, but it's interesting that that becomes the norm and there's so many unpaid untrained teachers in a martial arts club and, wow. and people just accept it you know they, they pay their money for a class and end up teaching a kids class and they're like what happened here where, where did my life go wrong yeah exactly it, it is a very strange setup so we never had it like that it's you know like you said people want me there to teach so i'm making sure that i going to everybody yeah. and cor correcting or I actually, um, a couple of years ago, I was listening and reading about overcoaching and nearly one of the reasons as well. So I stopped overcoaching and I let people do. But some of my students, they, all their grades saying, oh, you didn't correct him on this. No, let them experience. The corrections come later. Just let them try first kicking. Let them try punching. Let them do their own mistakes. And then we're going to have it. And interestingly, today I was talking with uh, the... With, uh, Georgia from Australia, who is a um, uh, coach for kickboxing for people with trauma. And she said that when you mm -hmm. overcoach, you stop people learning because when you make a mistake, you allow your brain to be more, having more plasticity and develop new skills so that mistakes doing the learning actually makes them learn instead of just copy, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. I probably butchered, but, butchered it, what she was explaining to me because I'm from the lower brain class, if you say so. <laughs> I, I think, you know, there's uh, the, the kind of a key phrase is something called soft coaching. So soft coaching, let's say I've spotted you doing, so, I'll, I'll use a martial arts example, you know, I might have spotted you doing a, a, quite a bad roundhouse kick, for argument's sake. Now I could stop what you're doing and explain to you and demonstrate and show how I do it and then verbalize it. Or I could just look at you and go, and you see me do that, and you think, okay, what am I doing wrong? And if I walk past mm -hmm. and go, that lets me know, right, okay, it's getting there, it's getting better. You know, I can be almost non-verbal with a wink, a smile, a, is that really what you want to be doing? Was that good mm -hmm. enough? You know, like those little things, because I don't want you to be stop starting all the time. Mm -hmm. I just want you to, to flow with it. A really good explanation is, you can make someone effective, 
but they have to make themselves efficient in a way. Like mm. I can show you how to effectively throw a jab in two minutes, but it's down to you then to make that efficient and better and sharper and faster and more strategic. So I think uh, a lot of martial arts jump to efficient before they really cover effective. Yeah. yeah if you can, I, I can, you can pop that. out your left hand fast and land it on someone's face, it's a jab. It's not the prettiest mm. one in the world, but it's the same jab everyone else has. You can just make it better now. Yeah, that's what I found when I moved to UK. I when I couldn't find the really um, suited for me karate karate style, so I went for boxing. Um, shout out to AKA Guildford Club. And first thing what they said is like, "Wow, your strikes are very precise. We don't do it like that. Why are you going so? You know, you're losing your your speed because you're trying to be so." technically correct that there's no need for it just just throw it it's like yeah. huh? but everybody says to me i have to have an elbow down this way 34.5 degree yeah. for efficiency it's like okay well I'll try your stuff and it feels so much more natural yeah exactly like and there's always a good middle ground there's good things to be learned from all coaching styles because what martial arts coaching is good for is it feels it's more like a premium product you know there's a lot more attention to service and your mindset and your happiness and how well you feel with it and fit in with it well as a rule generally you know i think um the customer service in martial arts is actually pretty good you know i do refer to things in terms of customer service if you're paying for a lesson you're a customer <laughs> um and so yeah there's, there's there's loads of different nuances to teaching but yeah over teaching is massively endemic in martial arts and boxing is suffering because of it too, because they've jumped into the tutorial lifestyle now. And mm -hmm. I said somewhat ironically, as someone that does YouTube channels and stuff, but there are more than ever before people saying, ah, you've been jabbing wrong your entire life, or actually you should know, you know, you'll see TikTokers go a hook this way. No, this way. Yeah. You know, people will, put forward what they think is the orthodoxy. This is the best way, the only way. Um, and here's 12 slip and hit drills, and here's 15 something else drills. We, we, we're drowning in drills. Um, mm. We don't need that many. Drowning in pad work as well. There's more pad work than has ever been done before. You know, there's crazy weird bastards out there holding their own pads and hitting them. And it's like, that was okay and kind of fun for lockdown, but don't do that again. Don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Only crazy people do that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to change a little bit subject because as you hear, I can I use it um, to help myself as well because that's the area of um, uh, interest to me. Plus, I know many instructors looking up to you in the way you're teaching seminars. Mm -hmm. Why? What's the secret for your popularity? Because, you know, every time when I'm teaching with you, it's for me inside, fuck, he's, he's going again. There's nothing I can do to beat you in kind of delivery. You've got a superb way of delivery with mixture of the, you know, great skills, humor, and just personality. And th that's always a problem for me, thinking how I'm going to engage people after Tommy, because there's not much I can do. Oh, that's very sweet and you needn't think anything like that i think for me it's energy management so you've got to have a really good eye on the people you've got and the room you've got and there's a there's a, like an energy frequency that i want people at where they're they're working hard and they're having fun and they're doing stuff and if i see it if i see someone dipping or chatting or doing it, I'm all over it really fast. And so energy management for me is I've got to look at partners that are training and the whole collective class. And I try and make sure that that's at the energy that I want it and my preferred pace. And that's why you see me doing things like having the whistle mm -hmm. and I issue quite clear commands and I raise my voice and I shout a lot. I always lose my voice at seminars. Like I'm quite, it sounds bad, but I'm quite controlling in a seminar. You know, like, this is the pace I'm setting. This is what I expect. Let's go, go, go. Let's do it, do it, do it. You know, And I think energy management 
a lot of martial arts instructors aren't good at that because it's quite soft. And, you know, like I will go to a multi-star seminar and there'll be me shouting, swearing, blowing my whistle, trying to put energy in. And then there'll be like a softly spoken wrist lock defense class on the mat next to me um, where there's no energy. There's no, there's nothing alive in that, on that mat. Um, so yeah, I think knowing what energy suits your demographic and then keeping to it. And anytime it dips below, if people are flagging, they're not getting it, you know, immediately being all over it. Like it's a fire, you know, I want to make sure the energy is high. If people are bored of a technique, you know, if people are bored, you've got to move on. Or if they didn't get it, or it was too complicated for them, uh, yeah, or they got it really fast because they're more skilled than you thought they were going to be. You know, you've got to be able to take all that data in, and and keep the pace high. Um, so yeah, that's what I, I try and do. I try and do everything I can to to set good pace and good energy. And if I can make people laugh or get their attention, I can hold it for longer. There's a lot of people where they'll speak at one tone all the way through. And so for me, it's a, I need to give you a kick up the ass every couple of sentences uh, just, to, just to put a bit more passion in there. It, passion is really important. And Eastern martial arts are almost like the passion killers out there. You're told to hold it all in. Whereas if you go to say, if you went to America right now and went to a high school wrestling class, there's going to be like, yeah, right, clap, boom, boom, boom. There's energy. Uh, you know, you go to a competitive judo club somewhere in Tokyo, Tokyo University Judo Club. There's going to be energy. Um, so energy management is a big one. And I was very fortunate to have instructors for, for most of my time learning where they've been good at energy management. And so I've, mm. I've stolen it, really. I've, like, that's, I've made that my own. Yeah, I... I... Uh, I don't know if you remember, but we taught, I won't say where because people might be offended, but we taught the seminar and I remember you came to me and you said, well, this crowd is really hard to start moving. They are really, really, really traditional group. And you said no. <laughs> they're really tough to do anything, isn't it? So how are you dealing with the pe people? Um, I think it's it's uh, dominant in the very traditional karate classes when they are all being told, you know, don't don't say anything. Don't ask questions. Don't do anything. How do you wake up the crowd like that when they start being, you know, unmovable, and you know, whatever you're trying, they go a little bit stagnant and don't want to do anything really. You know, they want to do, but they don't express the energy. They don't get involved. They just doing stuff, and that's it. I guilt them. So I'm like, look, <laughs> you've only got me for sixty minutes. If you give me sixty minutes of it, like I try and make it tangible, my expectations. You know, I might be with you for 45 minutes at a multi-style seminar. Please do what I ask of you and put the right energy in. It, you know, it's important. I make it important to me and make it personal. You know, it's that, uh, you know, I want you to take notes. I want you to get your phone out and film it. You know, I, I set my expectations because I'm also a big attendee of seminars and I've been to very good ones and very bad ones. And I know that it can get so exhausting. You forget when you're teaching how tiring it is for the people. Because I've done it a couple of reps and let you have a go. But you've done it for 90 reps for each technique I've shown you. You know, it's a lot more tiring to attend. So I think you have to have good empathy. So I think a good seminar instructor attends other seminars. Because then you sometimes you, you're too disconnected from what it's like to be an attendee. Mm. So I think. If I was to offer advice, you want to be a good seminar instructor, attend seminars so you build your empathy, ha have an energy frequency that you want to run it to, and be really clear with your expectations. So, for example, I might say, we're going to re really slow it down now, and I want you to pay very strong focus to my words. Or it might be, we're going to ramp up the pace now, and I want you to forget technicalities and just do it. You know, setting the pace and the tone and it's my job to notice whether people are flagging or not and some people just like different styles of instructor like for some people i am too much and with the whistling and the swearing and the contact and i will say like i don't put a huge amount of contact in seminars you know like i'll have people move a bit but 
you can get hit a lot more than going to a Tommy Joe Moore seminar. But for mm. some people, that's scary enough. You know, like the, the, the bit of contact I have put in there or that bit of upper body grappling for that demographic might be bloody terrifying. Um, but yeah, it's hard. You'll always have people that disengage or are not into it, especially at a multi-style seminar. And I've got to be frank in that, you know, what I might do isn't for you, but what you or your instructor might do in two hours time might not be for me, but I'll still do it. Um, mm. And you won't find anyone say that I go to a multi-style seminar and don't do everybody else's session too. You know, like whatever it is. You know, I was bloody doing kata at uh, <laughs> a seminar. The other, like I was following people doing all this. Stuff. I don't have a fucking clue what I'm doing, but I'll do it and I'll find value in it. Um, and so you should, you know, like it really bugs me. Like, and it, it's hard because if people don't do it because of age, I get that. That makes a lot of sense. Energy, you know, I manage it myself personally. But there's also a lot of people that will go to a multi-style seminar, wear the gear of power, watch for four hours, and then do their 30-minute thing. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, you've just missed out on four hours training. What's wrong with you? Like, this is this, you, this is, should be exciting for you. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people have fatigued themselves. They don't love it like they used to. A lot of martial arts instructors are like a lot of school teachers. You get mm. teachers that are very passionate and you get a teacher that has been teaching maths for 30 years and hates maths and hates kids and they're still teaching. And I think a lot of people that teach martial arts are that maths teacher. Mm. I, I tend to agree. But, you know, in defense of um, some situations, because personally, I like to get involved. I like to... Uh, train on the seminars I'm teaching because a, it gives me a personal connection with each person who I train uh, and it just widens my um, circle of friends but sometimes you know especially when I'm organizing if I don't go and take a pictures nobody will yeah. you know, it is like when you're organizing something it is I want to train but I want to make sure that people got the value from the club and everybody likes a nice picture of them doing stuff right so it is kind of between but if i'm like you know a, a guest teacher somewhere i i just like you would go from one to another and try everything but if i'm really really tired to say need to sit down and and stuff and, and anxiety doesn't help sometimes you know overwhelmed and just need the mental break from it yeah and what i have seen and what is also good i'll, I'll speak up on defense of some of the instructors that watch but don't do at the very least, they might walk around the room and guide or advise mm. people that are struggling with it. So that's also cool to see. So people don't want to actively do it, but they're still actively helping the energy of that class. That's cool. Like, I think, or if you're, I'm not going to do it, but I'll take some pictures or I'll make the tea or I'll do something. Like, that's good respect. You know, I think that's, because um, everyone's putting their time in. So it's mm. it's good to respect other people even if their stuff's not quite for you you've got to, you've got to do it um but I, I love it like i love all martial arts so if there's a i'm stiff as a board but if one of the things that's on is a capoeira session and that's the only thing i can go to i'll do that capoeira session or i'll have fun you know like I, I think as soon as you lose that love for what you're doing reassess whether you should still be teaching you know if you if you don't love it enough to go i'm going to look really shit at capoeira for half an hour if you're not willing to do that is it time for you to think uh maybe i should uh, try something different maybe take up golf <laughs> I, th I think as well there's an element of um people don't want to get embarrassed it's kind of you know, oh, yes. oh, I, I don't know what they're doing so i better not do so i don't lose my face right um, I think there's a, a lot of that coming from the higher grades in martial arts, especially in karate. It's like, I cannot lose face because I'm the, I'm the teacher, I'm the, I'm the top dog, and it's going to be not looking good if I do a full of myself, you know. So I think that's a part of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this comes from the, the cultural baggage of martial arts if I'm there with my black belt on, which is now a white belt again because it's all shredded and I'm used to crisp, clear, you know, everything goes, it's all done this way in my dojo. 
you don't want to look like you're in a kerfuffle or confused. Pe people worry about being seen to be weak or inefficient or ineffectual at, at stuff in front of, especially if they've bought a load of their students with them too. Um, but I don't think any, if a student sees their instructor trying something and maybe they're not perfect at it and then they judge their instructor, they were probably always going to be a shit student. Mm. You know, if a student sees your instructor having a go, that it should be like an officer, you know, an army officer. An army officer should be able to run as fast as every soldier and do every job a soldier does and be the first to volunteer to do it. And so I think if you're a martial arts instructor, you're an officer. And therefore, you know, I'm, I'm awake and running before you and my shoes are shinier than your shoes. I'm going to I'm going to be involved. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try. And I think that sets a good culture for the rest of the club. If the instructors always seem to try and have a go, the students are going to pick up on that. Uh, and that's going to be a good good energy that they've got in the future. Yeah, and I think as well, if, if your instructors shows you that they can do it and they're having fun while they're doing it, it creates more open-minded students. Oh, I can go somewhere and actually enjoy it, try different things instead of shy away from it, if that makes sense. But And then some people, to avoid that, waste your time. So... It sounds bad because a lot of people do this, but I might show something and they'll go, ah, we've got something like that, but we do it a bit like this. And it's like, that's really cool. But you've now wasted five minutes showing me how when I do this, you do that. And that's time I could have spent moving around this room. And it's your way of, because when people say that, often it's a, this is my excuse for it not looking like I've just you've just shown me you know it's a we do we tend to do it this way and it's like well that's cool but you do that 99% of your time try it the way I've just shown you please for now um you can, you can you can slag it off in your own time but don't I always call it caveating you know well we, we always do it different or you know we never kick to the head or we know it's always a we never or we always statement and it's just it's just chat just, just, just do the thing you were shown and have fun with it. You can decide if it's any good later. Mm. For me, it's actually quite opposite, especially when I'm training with you. There's yeah. things that people show me, I'll do it like this. I try on it like, no fucking way. <laughs> I'm not going to armbar him <laughs> like that because you're just going to lift me up and we're going to go. So it's just like, hmm, how do I need to do it so it makes sense that I can actually move you a little bit? There's a good example was the one we were training but on the knife seminar, right? Yeah, <laughs> but then I also get it's quite funny sometimes though because I'll have sometimes I'll go to a seminar and they'll they'll actively refuse to put something on me like oh well it, you know I, I'm not going to do it on you I'm not going to do it on you but you know for people that haven't met me I'm not a giant I'm like six foot two six foot three I'm eighteen stones I'm I'm a I'm a big man but I'm not a giant man uh, and I think. Sometimes it's an easy excuse. Oh, well, it would never work on him. It's like, well, there are a lot of people that are my size and bigger in the world. So you're going to have to find something, find a way. Like you said, well, I can't do it like that, but I'll do it like this. You, know, you should be you should be mentally plastic enough to find a way around it or discuss with your partner. You know, like, is this is this actually hurting you? Is this actually working? And you, your partner should be honest enough to go, yes, mm. no, a little bit. Um yeah, that honesty, being a good uke, you know, it's not about knowing how to break fall. It's about good honesty. I think you know, like, not being such of a dick that like I'm Mister Nothing Works on me, mm. but also being honest enough to say, yeah, that that wasn't quite on or was didn't quite work, and that's that's it's really awkward to navigate that. So I, I understand people that say nothing, but mm. that's why I like to rotate partners a lot at seminars. You will very rarely see me not do a rotation. Every every new technique, I tend to do a rotation. Um, sometimes people stay paired off, like you might have uh, people that might be, say, on the autistic spectrum that don't like that change, or there might be, you know, this is a big generalization, but you know, some women don't like things near throats and other, for all those kind of reasons. So I never penalize people for not swapping, but I will reward and recognize and encourage those that do. 
You know, that's mm. a big thing for me. So many body types out there. And a seminar is a golden from God opportunity to fight other bodies that you might never get to fight normally in your club, in your village hall, in your area of the world. You, know, you might never get the chance to try and take down a seven foot Belarusian man. <laughs> like, this is your golden opportunity. Uh, there's a really good, I don't know which Gracie it is. I think it might be Hickson Gracie. But uh, it talks about how when you first start out and you see a big person, you go, oh, how terrible, how scary. And then when you get good, you go, how interesting. You know, like that, that's a good mark of a martial artist. When you look at a problem and go, that's an interesting problem. You might not be able to solve it, but just finding the problem interesting is, is a good sign. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I kind of. Uh, I used to try to find a solution to to win with the much bigger opponents because pretty much everybody's bigger than me. But like you said, I I dropped that thing and I just accepted. You know, sometimes you're just gonna lose, and there's nothing you can do. You can try the best, and and it just won't work. So accept that, have fun, and try your best. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, the uh, I think the the biggest thing that kills the martial arts world, if there was one problem, one illness to solve, it's floating arm disease. I think most nine out of ten martial artists suffer from. I will do a super slow mo punch, and my arm will float suspended in animation like witchcraft for the next mm. seven seconds as you do your thing. And, you know, even in your world, like I see things, you know, in the in the kind of karate world, I'll see like highly practical bunkai application and it will suffer from floating arm disease. Mm. <laughs> floating I, arm I, disease is everywhere. I call it a frozen karate. Yeah. So, freeze. Um, but um, I think there's a physiological reason for it. But as always, martial artists uh, uh, inflated it. Because um, we we done few few testing. If you hit somebody who is not expecting, they've got that freeze for a split second. And mm -hmm. I think with time, it is oh, if I hit him, he's gonna keep that hand, and then he's gonna keep that hand for a second longer, and he's gonna go for a second longer, and then we got a thirty seconds frozen, and then I can do fifteen techniques, which looks great, but uh, it's creating the habits. I've got lots because most of my students are people from different systems. So I've got a huge problems with relearning people that we don't keep the hand, we're coming back. And I, I when I'm with paired with people on seminars, sometimes somebody takes me to do demo on me. And you can see that confusion on their face when I go punch, come back. Not fast, but it's one floating movement. It's like, why did you do that? Bring that hand back, because I'm gonna be doing stuff. So it is a problem, but you know. Every every sport, every art's got some issues. Yeah. So, but uh, float floating arm one. If I could banish one from the entire <laughs> scene, that would be the one I'd pick on. Uh, it's important. You need the floating arm for the first 15, 20 reps, and then the floating arm needs to go. You do you do need it sometimes, but then people forget when to fire the uh, the floating arm. Like you've done your suit. Thank you for your service, floating arm. It's now time for you to go away. <laughs> I, I think going back into what you said about the different demographics for a, for a, um, martial arts, one of the problems we're seeing in my club is people not wanting to punch you in the face. They always yeah. go sideways and they stood there, but you didn't hit that's my head. Come here. And we've got a new student, actually, a really lovely girl. And she said, oh, but I don't want to punch you in the face. But hey. That's the goal of it. That's my face. You've got gloves. That's where it goes. Oh, but I don't want to. Don't want to hit you. So it goes <laughs> to the side. So that's the and other that's problem, what, which I would banish. It's why I tend to have quite physical warm-ups. Like my warm-ups are typically games, and they are contact-based games. So you have to push, shove, grapple, mm -hmm. slap each other a bit. Like I think if you can break that taboo early of being hit, poked stuff happening it's less weird when i ask you to do it later whereas if we do a warm-up of star jumps and push-ups and knee twists i'm still not ready to hit poke prod throw people like mm -hmm. uh, to get people ready for wrestling i tend to do something called giraffe wrestling so when two giraffes fight they wrap their necks around each other yeah. so i get people no hands we've got to go neck to neck and just use our heads 
to manipulate, to push, to pull. It's a stupid little game. It's giraffe wrestling, but it gets you used to a bit of competition, a bit of contact. Your ear might get a bit red. Your face might get a bit sore if someone's got a beard. But it, it just it gets you mentally ready and physically ready for a for a bit of friction. You know, all all fighting is friction, whether I'm grappling or striking. If I, if there's no friction, there's no fighting. Mm. You know, for me. So even if it's very slow, you still you know, even drilling slow, I should still grip you hard, and I still do. There should always be a sense of friction going on. Do you coming up with those going games or do you stealing them from other people? All sorts. So some I come up with, some I steal and then I change. Um, uh, some I get bored of and forget and then find them in an old YouTube video that I've done and, and launch them again. Uh, I try to bring a new set of games to each seminar if I can. Um, this is where it gets quite hard for me because... You're teaching a lot. I teach a lot <laughs> and therefore there's a lot of people... The, a portion, say a third or a half of people might have trained with me before mm. and have done that game. But then the other half haven't. Um, so it, it's always, I have to try and make adjustments and play with what might work and what not. But you know, I did um, coaching qualifications with England Boxing a year mm. and a bit ago. And they, they trained the guys that go to the Olympics. And they were talking about how their general warm-ups, they don't do them anymore. Everything is gamified, even if you are the top level amateur heavyweight going to the Olympics on the squad, you still will play games where you bounce the ball, goes in the air, bam, 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 catch it again. You'll still play, you know, slap based games. You'll still do those fun things. You'll play stuck in the mud and dodgeball. And the, so you know, even people at the very highest levels, gamified, dynamic warm ups. Mm. Uh, are the way forward and that's what that's what most combat sports people are doing at the highest levels they're they're making things games to be fun to be active um traditional warm-ups are kind of dead you know like a very i will i can't remember the last time i've done a circle your arms bend your knees twist your hips i'd much rather have people play a game of tag or have people play a game of dodgeball because they're still moving, getting loose, breathing, but they're also being twatted in the face with a pad flying at 30 mm. miles an hour. You know, if I, if I can get the same workout and attributes, things like stretching are different because you're doing that strategically for a reason. Mm. But for, for most things, if I can get a bit of contact and a bit of friction in a warm up, it makes my life easier instructing later when I want you to throw, slam, and hit each other. Mm. Yeah, I'm kind of, I've been, I've been playing with that, um, making a warm ups not traditional run around the stuff, but I reverted back because my guys in the club are most plus 40. Mm -hmm. So as Marek uh, from Poland says, you might use martial arts in life sometime, but you will use your body every day. So I'm doing mm -hmm. a warm up to mobilize the joints, flexibility. We do like animal movements. So mm -hmm. kind of try to mobilize all, all the body. So I was like, mm, should we do martial arts warm up or should I try to restore a little bit mobility? So I kind of do a free part of it. Restor restoration work, martial arts, sparring. Um, and what you do well, which I very re rarely see people do, is you add a bit of a mental warm up, you know, with your one, three, seven game and yes, no, and so on. <laughs> so you're one of the very few people I see focus on waking the mind up as well as the body, which is really good to see. You know, if you can get people solving problems or, you know, asking questions at the start of a seminar or a session, you know, is your brain in this dojo? Your body's in the dojo, but is your brain in the dojo? What can I do to bring it here? Um, I think you do that very well. Yeah, that's stolen from friends. I can't remember where I stole it. I think, oh no, I know where I stole it from. It was from my uh, disability coaching. They had a quite a f good games and ways to engage people with disabilities. Because for example, <clears throat> we've got a few people who've got the MS, so they cannot like move around and stuff. And when we do the game of um, flipping cones, so how the mm -hmm. cones are up, how's down, everybody have to run and switch them around. So we, I found that the, some people cannot do that. So they kind of outside of the group. 
So they taught us how to make them engage and you give them a timer, you give them a scoring points, you know, just taking care of it. So they are part of the group in a game, but they don't do actual physical activity. So mm -hmm. that kind of changed my way of thinking of kind of a group training, right? So, so it works, but you know, I think like the same problem as you've got so many people who train with me on seminars that is like, yeah, I, he's going to do that game. Luckily, no, not everybody can count to three and it's difficult to count to three. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's, it's a it's a fun and it's really good to break the ice because you're changing partners, like you said, as well. Um, and, and you get somebody new and you get embarrassed with that person because counting to three is not so easy when you start changing to yes and stomps and, and physical movements. And, and everybody can chill and relax and the atmosphere is better. I think another important thing, you know, uh, if I was to give a piece of advice, I think one of the reasons why I get pretty good attendance at seminars and, and people tend to like it is you pick something disruptive that they may not have done in a very long time. So I get people come to a seminar and the first thing I might get them to do is put your shoes back on and we're going on a 15 minute walk and we're going to find different types of people that we would attack if we had to. And we're going to look at what that might be. So you've just got in, you know, you've, you've taken off all your stuff, you're taking your shoes off, whatever. You know, I'm going to completely mess with your mind and say, right, shoes back on, 15 minute walk, take your phone with you. Who have you seen that would make a good victim and why? Do that, come back, let's talk about it. And then let's see what we can do to mitigate it. Or I might not prepare you and say, right, the entirety of this seminar is going to be done with the curtains closed and the lights off. It's going to be very dark in here. And, you know, and then halfway through, I'm going to put the lights on and you're going to be like, oh, you're like blind. You know, doing, just completely messing with people's idea of what this session is going to be and work like and look like is, is always a, a good thing. Mm. Uh, or I'll set things like this. Uh, I'll have my whistle and I'll say at the very start, if I blow my whistle three times at any point today, I want you to all stop what you're doing, sit down immediately and pay immediate attention to me because an emergency has happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, halfway through, I go, boom, 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 and see how many people could remember that information, do the thing they were told. Um, Practising calling 999 after an accident. That's why I might have random sparring. I might go, right, you two are going to spar. Six seconds. I'm going to move one person out of the room and I'm be like, right, what was he wearing? What colour shoes was he wearing? What colour trousers was he wearing? What did his face look like? You know, all these things mm. mess with people's minds. I'm a, I'm a bugger for starting sparring with noses touching or starting sparring where my nose touches the back of your head. And people are like, oh, that's weird. And I'm like, that's life. That's life sparring. Mm. Um. It's just it's just weird stuff that gets people a bit more switched on because we get into a pattern and we get lazy and a seminar above all else should be a pattern breaker. It should come in and mess up all the crayons and mess up all the paints. That's what it's there to do. Then you put them back in an order again. But I think a good seminar takes everything you thought was going to happen, go <laughs> and, then, and see where it lands again. Uh, but things like take your people outside, take your people to a film, practice calling 999, get everyone downloading what three words on their phone and mm. see if they can find each other like loved ones, <laughs> this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, those kind of things require good, you should, a good instructor should think about it. You know, you should, mm. don't just go there and make up your plan on the spot. You know, it's pre-work. People think it's off the cuff, but for every seminar I teach, there's probably 10 pages of stuff, which I could only ever get through three. Mm. But I've gone through that mental process of, yeah. of what for these people. Yeah, for, for me, it's the same. It always takes a couple of weeks. You know, I know the seminar is already in the background. There's a plan creating, you're writing down, you think about it. And now I'm going to change this. And it's kind of constant work in the background. You know, yeah. every every break in the training, oh, what I'm going to do in a seminar, I'm going to do this. Let me try in training, see how it works. And then we're going to put that in or take it out. So people think it's just, you know, you're turning up and doing. And I think because lots of people actually do that with the session as well, right? No, I, I'm, I'm seeing that many martial artists just wing it. 
Yeah. Just come in and do it. There's no long planning. There's no short. There's no medium plan. That's what I love about sports because you've got a season and you have to have a preparation. You have to have a recovery. You have to have a strength. You have to have a speed technique. So I try to, my training is based heavily on uh, uh, wrestling methodology. So mm. we've got a cycles that we do different things through the year. Although it's very difficult when you've got people coming once a week or every second week. So I understand that, but you cannot just go and, ah, today let's do kicks. Tomorrow mm. let's do rolling. It's, it's have to kind of tie each other. And I think that that's what's missing A, in seminars and in, in training in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I've got some questions to you, dear sir. Okay. Only three because people are lazy on the internet. So I thought he's gonna have more, but hey ho. But they are very interesting one. From okay. your best best fans out there internationally. So we've okay. got a from from UK, the awesome Mary Stevens mm -hmm. is asking you if Tommy could only teach one out of Partitsu World War Two combatis or historic boxing boxing which one it would be and why that's going to be fucking three hours isn't it <laughs> lecture uh, i would say that if, if i was forced to only teach one i would say that probably the, the world war ii combative stuff is is the nice mix between historical content and things that you can practically use today um some of the bartitsu stuff is very very fun but antiquated and it's more of a historic pastime you can have a go and explore how people did it but a good portion of that you just would be very unwise to do today mm. the historic boxing is very interesting um, but the word boxing and the notion of boxing puts off nine out of ten martial artists straight away because in their mind they've already put it in a box which is nothing to do with martial arts like in their minds, it's something that's either a big fight on TV or something their mom and sister do down at the leisure centre on the pads. One, two, 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 two. You know, it's like most martial artists want nothing to do with it. So it's quite a hard sell. So you'd have to be really into it, a bit of a nerd to, to really like it. Um, but the World War II combatives, there's lots of history, storytelling, drills, make it practical. Um, yeah, I would say if you force me to teach only one, that would be the one I personally get the most enjoyment out of doing. Um, yeah. Um, one thing I picked up from it, and, and I think might be a, a difference. So we're going to come back to questions. But what do you, what do you personally think about that um, now popularity of um, boxer size? Is it good for boxing or is it a bad thing for boxing? Because, you know, I personally don't agree giving a people qualification of holding pads after one day of online um, coaching, but then more people does boxing, so there's more chances that people are gonna go to the gym actually not be scared of it. So it's kind of yeah. weird. I, I have to say, I think it's mostly harmless and I've got no real problem with it. Like there's a lot of people, for example, in my normal working job, they know that I like and do boxing. Mm -hmm. And then they'll come up to me and they'll be really excited. They'll be like, oh, I've been doing this boxer size thing at the gym. It's really fun. And I've, I've personally seen the life-changing power for some people of just 15 to 20 minutes hitting some pads with some other mm. people. And that has boosted their confidence. Can they fight? No. But they're confident and they're happy. And it's a cool thing for them, you know. And so I think the benefits of it far outweigh the drawbacks. And so... You can learn to safely hold pads well enough in a day if you're not an idiot. Um, are you going to learn to be able to teach effective combinations? No, of course you're not. And you're not going to move like a fighter. But I think you just need to put it in an area that's nothing to do with fighting. It's just, it's mm -hmm. a cardio game with pads. And that's cool. That like, And if that's the gateway drug for them to go, actually, I'd like to maybe start doing some more of this in a different way. That's phenomenal. You know, like... Mm. In the same way, I'm very unbiased. A lot of people that are into the things that I'm into hate things like musical kata and people making their own forms. And I'm like, nah, that's cool. Whatever gets people into this game is awesome in my book. And if you need to go through a 5, 10, 15, 20-year phase of your life doing 
no touch knockouts or aikido or musical spinning bow staff forms if that makes you happy and gets you out of the house and makes you friends i'm overjoyed for you and i think that's that's fabulous it's not my taste but it doesn't need to be my taste and and it should i sh i look poorly at people that judge that i see lots of so i really dislike the channel muck dojo life because mm. it really it's a let's laugh at some people that do this maybe once a week you know and it's yeah. like why, why would we laugh at that middle-aged mom i mean she's utterly butchering that bow catter but she's having a good time leave her alone yeah. stop being a dick that could be your mom <laughs> you know like a, what? I, I i i had rob on my channel um, and I'm kind of in two minds. I think because mm. it's his job, he's now needs to put stuff like that out to mm. get the views. But I think the idea of um, highlighting the like pedophiles is a good idea, and you know, highlighting mm. what's going on so people have more awareness. So I think it started really good, but I think he's a bit lost sometimes because it's his job. So he needs to have eyeballs and then he takes it to uh, Mac Dojo. I know there's lots of people hating my dojo, Mac Dojos. Um, I've been that person. I had a big issues with Mac Dojos. But then I realized pretty much what you said that, you know, A, people in Mac Dojos know what they're subscribing to. People who teach it know exactly what they teach. And if they're both happy, why not? Right. Exactly. If, if if they do thirty minutes of workouts, that's better than sitting on a couch. There's a hot tip for you, actually. So there's a chap called Paul Harrison. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's I know. I know. I, I know. Yeah. Paul. Yeah. And one of Paul's first jobs ever was he went to a, a GKR mm. club. You know, and for I suppose for people watching and listening to this, this is essentially where you get given for no good reason your black belt and you go teach like it's like mm. i've got no bones about it it's, it's a ponzi sales, sales scheme but it's really interesting how he explained how they prepared him you know he's a he's a smart guy and they they prepared him and they supported it and they had a set process and a structure and whilst that gkr experience gave him no useful martial skills you know the having gone through that experience and, and learned from it, there, there was a lot of things of value there as well in terms of mm -hmm. how they structured and packaged and sold what they do. You know, a lot of, a lot of clubs would be very wise to look at the GKR model and say, well, what, what of that? We don't like it ethically, but what of that worked? And what mm -hmm. could we learn from that? And what bits of that could we take away? Uh, so yeah, I think it'd be an interesting one to reveal what it's like to be in a muck dojo. But I think, muck dojos are vital to martial arts i think it's a bit like having a food chain right and if you take away the muck dojo food like that's like taking all the bugs out of an ecosystem mm. so then there's nothing to feed the birds and then there's nothing to feed the cats and there's nothing to feed something else you know like you need a layer of muck dojo -ness. they fill a really important role for most people starting or trying martial arts and that's mm. that's fine because what we it's not a muck dojo really like we use the term muck dojo it's not a muck dojo unless you are being actually deceived unless someone's going out of their way to deceive you mm. like i don't think much of a keto is useful at all but i can't say it's a muck dojo because mm. they're teaching and doing a keto do i think much Aikido, I think people can make it work, but I'd say as a rule, you know, it's not not great efficacy there. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't go out of my way and say it's a muck dojo, but it, it it fits it fits part of that food chain, you know, in that if mm -hmm. I go into Aikido, do five years, think that oh, was kind of fun, but actually that Thai boxing or BJJ club or Kyokushin club, that's me now, that's me at a bit more of an next level then the Aikido did its job. You know, it moved you through into the chain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the yeah. same way that a local drama club, it's not going to be as good as going to the top acting classes in the in the world, but you need to still have the local village hall drama groups and Christmas plays to feed the, the top performing, you know, Royal Shakespeare Company actors. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I've yeah, I've got a few students of mine who went from the GKR and and other local clubs that you know. But it's the this other side of it is that you know they coming with the black belt and high grade and then suddenly get punched in the face and it's like oh I didn't really learn anything, but the the what was put in their head is that you are a legitimate black belt you doing self defense you're gonna be super killer and then it comes up you know short guy like myself punching in the face like oh it didn't work you know my black belt is worth nothing so it's kind of interesting for me and i'm not saying i'm super great and stuff like that but people coming to my dojo usually within six months taking their belts off and starting afresh um, because we're doing things a bit differently um, so it's kind of I, always wondering it how much courage it actually takes to take off your belt, look in the mirror and say, well, we need to fix things. And, you know, I love that personally. I back in the BJJ and wearing that white belt. It's such a refreshing thing because you don't have that burden of being a teacher. You can do and just, I don't care, not my group. I'm just doing stuff. I think the important thing is instructors allowing the students to come to that realization Instead mm. of saying, I've looked at you and you are no way black belt level, you are a green belt level. Like that's yeah, yeah, yeah. so psychologically, da and even though it's, it's damaging for people. Yeah. If you're a good club and you're wise, then they will come as a black belt. They'll do a bit and think they'll come to you and say, you know what? Mm. I'm not quite there yet. That's the ideal to get to. Yeah, I think yeah. it's very easy to shame people and, I see because I'm, I'm external to the karate world. Like I am karate adjacent. I've got lots of lots of friends in it, but it's not my toy. Mm. And, you know, you'll get the sports guys that get looked on poorly by the bunkai specialists that get looked on poorly by the whatever people. Mm. You know, there's, there's, there's always that little bit of hate, little bit of bias. Like I personally like and think is quite good, but everybody slams it. I think some of the point fighters are really good and they're really fast and they can get stuff done. Like I've got no problem with semi-contact martial arts formats. They've, they've all got a value in there somewhere. And people laugh and say, oh, it's stupid. They're barely hitting each other. But I've done thousands of rounds in boxing where the contact hasn't been much more than that. You know, just drilling, sparring, moving. You know, it's, it's a useful tool. We all do it. Uh, but I think as soon as you put some pyjamas on the people, you're like, ah, it's the point fighter people. It's the semi-contact people. Yeah, I've, people been, I, I, I've been cured from thinking like that quite early. It was, must have been about 2003. So we've been always fed with, from Kyokushin side of things. We're the strongest karate. We can do it. And in the same room, so we'd be uh, us, karate people, with the wrestlers. And opposite side was other karate and taekwondo. And we've always been laughing at taekwondo. Well, what are they doing? Till I didn't go for sparrings with them, and they're blitzing in with the punches in the face. I couldn't deal with it. I've been mm. I've been just out out run because we don't do we didn't do at the time punching to the face, and that was one of the most valuable lessons to not, um, uh, kind of not laugh, but uh, what do you call it? Under not that in value, underappreciated. Yeah. Help me, help me. <laughs> <laughs> don't be disrespectful to other people. Because you, you, what it looks like, and it's back to what you said, what it looks like from outside, it's completely different when you're standing against the man. Yeah. Oh, Every, man. Everything looks slow and everything looks bad from your screen or from the side of the map. You know? And from when you do stuff, people will be on the side of your map going, you look slow. Mm. Uh, like I've had a lot of people that will see me in a YouTube video and they'll see me doing pads or they'll see me doing bags. And they'll be like, ah, you're wide open there or you're slow there or you're not moving your feet enough. The amount of time I get, you're not moving your feet enough or your hand doesn't go back to your face. And then they'll spar me and I'll punch nine holes in them <laughs> without them being able to do anything. They're like, I can make me work. You know, that's mm. when, you, when you watch it from the side, it's easy to go, ah, that's what I do, that's what mm. I do. But you don't. <laughs> so you, you have to be phenomenally talented to exploit the things your brain sees in real mm. time it's easy well, to exploit the things your brain sees in passive time but in active mm. time when you're in it 
your mind might know, ah, oh, slip that, but you won't. <laughs> That's why we've got so many experts watching boxing, isn't it? Oh, he done this. Oh, I would do it like that. I would do it like this. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's so easy. People really underestimate the time warp perception of adrenaline for both mm -hmm. parties in that you both think you're going really fast. You might be going relatively slow, but that doesn't matter. The time for the crowd doesn't really matter. It's only between me and my opponent. We're both in our own time, in our own measure. It's like you've made a world. You know, you've made you've made a world and it's got different rules to anywhere else outside of that ring or off that mat. Um, yeah. Most BJJ, for example, looks painfully slow, doesn't it? Yeah. When you watch it, it looks painfully slow. But when you're the person underneath and you can't breathe and you can't really figure out where someone's hand, arm, elbow, foot is, mm. it's fast. You know, so it looks slow, but it's fast. It's like it's like the avalanche effect, isn't it? The avalanche is moving at 500 miles an hour. But when you watch the film of the avalanche, you're like, ah, oh, I'd run away. I'd climb up mm. that tree. No, you wouldn't. Yeah, You'd yeah. be dead <laughs> straight away. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, so next question is from uh, Netherlands, from Michiel. I don't know, did you ever met Michiel? I can't remember. Maybe. I, if, if I have. Very, I'm very tall, up. very tall, skinny lad. Super, super nice. Uh, so Michiel asks, I wonder what Tommy's thoughts are on finding the balance between soft skills and hard skills when teaching self-defense. Okay. So I think we as a martial society have got if we've gone too deep into the soft skills pond in that well, a lot of martial arts instructors have become amateur psychologists, detectives, criminologists, lawyers, you know, that they, they, they call it the Miyagi effect, don't they? Everyone, you expect everyone to be like Mr. Miyagi who can solve, fix your car, find you a girlfriend, <laughs> solve your life, sort your knees out, teach you how to fight. You know, it's, it's fictional. We, we, we build up too much hopes for our sensei. They're just slightly better than us at stuff. <laughs> and they only really should be fighting stuff that they're slightly better than us at. But I think with soft skills, like, controversially, I think drilling soft skills is largely a waste of time. And that's going to get me a lot of heat. But let's say you and I, Les, we are practicing verbal de-escalation. You know me and I know you. And no matter how much you might pretend to be a gangster from Brixton in London, in no way is how you speaking to me matching how actual gangsters speak to me. There's no fear. There's no worry. There's no surprise. Uh, you know, the, the, these, these acting drills, they're, they're, they're very amateur dramatics. And people can get very good at fake arguing. And I'm not sure that's the best use of your dojo time. So I think learning the principles, you know, how to how to disengage from a conversation, how to ask questions, you know, what can I do to make this right? How can I fix this? So I do think there are certain powerful words and phrases and things you can learn. But I think too many people are putting a whole lot of time into verbal skills. And I also really think you've either got it or you don't. If you work as a teacher or a nurse if you work in public services in any way, you'll get quite good at this. But I think it's largely a personal skill that you can't make much sharper. Mm -hmm. I also have this view of martial arts too. I think you can get better at martial arts, but I think whether you will fight back or not is largely already pre-decided in your genes, in your how you've been raised, you know, what your mindset's already like. So whether you fight or not, I don't think that can be trained into you. It just is. Mm. And whether you can calm people down or talk your way out of it, I think to a great extent, that's already pre-decided in your character. Are you funny? Are you calming? Are you aggressive? Um, those things are pre so It's like a computer game. You've already The, the mm. characteristics have already been set. Um, so yeah, I think soft skills, you put too much attention on it. It's important. But, A, don't pretend you're good at them if you're not. Just refer people to others that are good mm. at them. I see a lot of people that are really good at physical skills do a terrible job at verbal skills because they feel like they have to or they should. And I think a lot of martial arts clubs shame 
you into talking about soft skills more than you should? They're like, well, everybody should know the 37 points of de-escalation. Shit you not, I went to a instructor seminar once and there was a young lady up at the front and she started to talk to people about people's gut microbiome and how that may change how you can verbally de-escalate them or speak to them. And it's like, in a threatening situation, if you're thinking about someone's gut microbiome or their hormonal cycle, like, I don't even know what planet you are on. <laughs> You've got too much time excuse, in your life. Excuse me, sir, you had too much carrots today. You cannot attack me. Your, your gut is making yeah. you... Yeah. It's, it's not you, it's the carb speaking. I understand, <laughs> sir, but too much, too much starch, too much starch in your diet. No, so I get it, it's important. I don't really enjoy... I, I've got good soft skills, personally. Mm. I, I can talk things down, I can make people laugh. I can typically empathize and, and, and use my voice well, but I don't enjoy teaching it. And it's not a fun thing for me. And no one is queuing up around the block for a Tommy Joe Moore speaking seminar. You know, they-, they... But have you tried it? <laughs> well, I have, I've, I've, I've posted things on. Now, areas where that's a bit different. I've had good success in teaching seminars, as in how to set better drills and to instruct. Mm. I think that has value. But in terms of the soft skills, I think it's it's market value and it's real value has come a bit out of kilter, and it's it's, it's just an it's just an odd one. There's, uh, people build in people talk about ah oh, don't make the techniques too complex, right? So they say don't make the physical techniques too complex, and then they'll have nine pages of content on how to say sorry I'm not interested, mate, or I need to go, or please don't do that. You know they'll then make the verbal side really complex and it needn't be um i think joe saunders does it very well because he's he's kind of his teaching point is built first on empathy and i think that's a really good learning point you know if you can tap into the idea that i need to empathize with you and there'll be certain things that your ego will or won't want and there's a couple of different keywords that are very powerful that's a good bucket of knowledge I think then people just overfill the bucket with more unnecessary drills and more unnecessary pseudo psychology. So much pseudo psychology in there. Um, so much like college level psychology and philosophy that goes in that, that needn't really. Um, you speak to any good A&E nurse, they'll have a couple of words they say that can calm down most people. That's all they need. They don't need a million seminars on how to speak to people. Um, that should be the thing we're most good at and need to drill the least, how to communicate to people, surely. Mm. I, you know, you don't, I don't punch someone in the face every day, but I speak to a human being every day <laughs> that I'm alive on this planet. True, very true. I think that's going to put you in a bit of a, um, trouble again because you already ha get some hate from um, self-defense organization and clubs, isn't it? Because you're hanging out with the karate folk and and so on they all, and so on. They all hate each other it's so daft i get i get problems from using the word self-defense they're like no no self-protection is the hard skills and self-defense is the soft skills and the lead. and i'm like according to who when was this big grand council where we all decided what these words mean like mm. ask most normal people on the planet self-defense is defending yourself whether that's verbally legally morally ethically physically you know it's just that it's the easiest most common sense way simplest way to describe what we do i will help and people say ah but self-defense makes you passive because it's got the word defense in it no 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 no, no. you training in a system called self-defense doesn't make someone immediately go i cannot strike i must only block it it's just part of this martial arts pop culture that's karate for you but i think there's also mega myths in the martial arts like to give you a mega myth right because i've got one here how many times have you heard the crap and what I think fictional stories where they say, ah, I'm not going to hand you the knife back after we do the drill because I heard someone when they were attacked disarmed someone and gave the knife back. Like I, mm -hmm. These myths exist and people will swear that they know people that actually did this. I think there are so many mm -hmm. mega myths that have been told so many times people will blindly swear that it's actually happened and it happened to their Uncle Jeff. Like there's, there's millions of these like little little pithy anecdotes and stories and i'm like 
no, this is not yeah. happening. This is nonsense. Yeah, I, I, I like to ask people when they say, oh, and you do this and you break the arm. But how many arms did you actually broken? Oh, I didn't by my teacher. How many actually your teacher broke arms in the training? Oh, I don't know. Well, probably not many. And it, yeah, it's possible, but it's probably very difficult to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. So yeah, for me, things like soft skills, yes, important. Yes, I think we make them over important. They're easy to teach lots of seminars about. They're easy to write books about. They're easy to make drills about. And that has made a market into itself. Mm. Um, but and understanding that if things can't be talked down, you have to have the baseline physical skill. You know, I think if you get the physical skill and you layer on the soft, I, for me, I think that algorithm works better than doing nine lessons of verbal and one lesson of physical. That, that's just mm. my, my take on it. Because you will be able to intuit and naturally talk down a lot of things using your normal human being conversational powers if you're not an idiot. And if you are an idiot, no amount of teaching is going to help you anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fair point. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a, I have a problem with this because I don't teach self defense. So we do yeah. uh, just sports or activity for mental health. So another question, this time from States, uh, from Tom. Um, how many arts have you trained, and in what what are they? What are your favorite techniques? That's two questions. Chinja. Shaolin eagle fat. Chinja. <laughs> <laughs> oh god loads and loads and loads of martial arts systems so i started i was very lucky to start with boxing and judo which if you ask most people that have got a fair and impartial view those are two pretty good things to start with especially as a younger person because my fear of being slammed on stuff and punched in the face has diminished hugely because that has been so normal for so long of my life that a very little worry or fear about being hit, knocked around, or being gripped and thrown. So like, I don't, like, they inure you very quickly. And so I've got big lifelong passion. I don't do the judo anymore. Um, I do occasionally do the sumo, which I quite like, because the hard thing with grappling is it requires so much more constant maintenance, in my opinion, mm -hmm. than the strike, in that... You can't really half-heartedly do your grappling. You could do your striking once a week, twice a week, whatever. I don't. You know, I choose. I enjoy the striking. That's what I do. But I think there's no point half-assing your grappling. So I don't have enough time to put to it now. But I did for quite a long time. Um, thai boxing was something I did for many, many, many years. Like a big stretch of time with... Uh, Ben Bates, Eddie Quinn, Bob Spur, where I'm from in Birmingham, there's a big Thai boxing scene. And uh, there's the prior pitch I camps. I remember lots of interclubs, which I really enjoyed. So lots of fights. Mm -hmm. And I was always quite tall. So I'd end up fighting men. I'd end up fighting men all the time. And I'd be like 10, 11, 12. And there'd be like a 20 year old I need to fight. And it'd be fucking terrifying. Um, but that was also a good experience in a way um but i loved i love thai boxing i've got massive respect for for that and one of my first instructors in that eddie quinn who still teaches the thai but he's moved more into salat what i've quite found quite interesting is most of my thai boxing instructors as they've got old have moved into salat and martial artsy stuff so in their younger years up until their 40s thai boxing thai boxing thai boxing and then all of them have then moved into something a bit more esoteric, like Salat or Kali or whatever. So it's an interesting observation. Um, but a lot of how I teach is what I've discerned from Eddie Quinn, who is a marvellous instructor, a lovely man, extremely friendly. Um, he had, did no martial arts. He intervened in a woman being attacked. And I think he got stabbed about nine times. His body's full of holes. And he nearly died and he came back to life. And the doctor said, you need to get fit now to recover. Uh, why don't you try something like martial arts? And he did. Mm -hmm. And that, that's changed the entire nature of his life. Um, but how he instructs changed the way I instruct. Um, mm -hmm. I'm from a very poor family. And 
My mum didn't have much money and she sometimes struggled to get me to the place where the Thai boxing was. And Eddie would go out of his way, pick me up in his car, drive me there, like charged hardly anything. I've always been really lucky with instructors. Most of them have charged me very little because I train a lot. I've always been the person that's there for the three days and then the extra day. You know, I've always been that person. And so, and you yourself, if someone came to you and said, I can't afford it, but I really want to do it, you would say yes, you know, or you'd yeah, find we, a way. We've, we've yeah. got about five people <laughs> like that time, driving them around, dropping off after classes. And, yeah, because yeah. they, they also, what they, what they lose you in money, they give you in energy in that, mm. If you're not at that class that day, everyone's a bit sad. It doesn't have the same. Sometimes you can lose. A, you, know, you can have a student not be there, and that loses you the money. Not even, mm. um, but yeah, Eddie Quinn, uh, Nigel Trotman, who's a Jeet Kune Do instructor, trained with him for many many years. I really enjoy Jeet Kune Do. You know, because it's so personal. You, know, you can mm. end what you're good at. If you're good at boxing, cool. If you're good at kicking, cool. Um, and I fought and competed in Savat for, for quite some time with uh, my, my fab Frenchman, uh, Alain Jean-Baptiste, most French name ever. Oh, he's uh, mm. not Frenchman, I think he's from Mali or some, somewhere like that, Maldives, Mali, somewhere like that. Um, but people will not believe that I used to wear a elastic all-in-one singlet and I used to kick people and kick people relatively high in the face. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I've done loads of stuff uh, they typically tend to be at the combat sports side mm. i've done very few martial arts i've always been in the martial arts world but you know in terms of the pajama world be it silk chinese or white japanese it's never really been my thing but i've always trained with martial artists uh, mm. weapon systems kali systems uh, krav maga kapap uh, Brett McKenzie, he's a good friend of mine. I've been too long, but you know, learning firearms from him. So I'm always picking up something new and engaging stuff. But at its core, the boxing, the judo, that's been really important to me. Um, everything else is pretty modular. It fits what I wanted or needed at that time. Some things I keep up. Some things I don't keep up in a formal fashion anymore, but they make my personal training. Because sometimes people forget what you teach and what you train can be very different. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's things that I do just for me that never make it to a seminar, but I enjoy doing them and I'm good at them, but they're just not, they're not what you come to a Tommy Joe Moore seminar for. You know, like people are not going to want to come to me for Someone. using, yeah, for, for types of uh, using stick and a knife. You know, they're very mm -hmm. unlikely to come to me for that. I'm really good. With two sticks, one stick sticking up, but that's not that's not my product that I sell, but it's something I can do well. Um, and we've all got that, I think. We've all got things that we're good at that we teach and things we're good at that we don't. And uh, mm -hmm. I've been quite fortunate to do martial arts for so long that, you know, I always use the Batman analogy. Batman has a belt with his favourite tools and he's got his back cave full of things he doesn't use very often but are still useful. Mm -hmm. And so I've got martial arts stuff that's on my back belt at all times, combatives, boxing, that type of stuff. But there's things in the back cave, you know, uses of weapons and different grappling systems and soft skills and first aid and martial arts and the law that aren't my jam to teach, but they're in my back cave. I can access them. Um, and I think it's a really good way to think about things. And when your life changes, some things go from the belt to the cave. And some things go from the cave to the belt. Um, and that will always flex. You know, when I become an older gentleman, I'm going to spend much less time boxing and a lot more time using sticks. <laughs> you know, I'm going to spend a lot more time doing other things. Um, but, you know, just matching your martial arts to your life as it is now and understanding that that will change. I think that's a good, healthy behavior to have. Mm. But to answer the first question, lots and lots of stuff. It's nice to see that we've got a very similar... Um, in a way, upbringing, martial art upbringing, because I never been afforded to have a classes and I had the classes for free. I don't remember where I last time paid for my uh, classes being back in Poland <clears throat> as well. Wrestling changed my, changed my life. Karate has always been there for a punching, kicking, but the, the grappling was wrestling. 
and um and i see karate as a one of those activities like your coaches you moving into your 40s 50s because it's got that that um mobility aspects of it and longevity aspect with the katas when yeah, i can be 90 years old and go to the park and do my karate it doesn't involve punching but i'm still doing my karate i'm still doing something i love and i think that's one of the reasons why i so enjoy doing karate yeah i think it's a natural lifestyle you know like people that love boxing all their life they tend to when they get old wear their coat sit on the bench gossip grumble drink coffee and shout mm -hmm. at young people and say put your elbow in turn your feet more <laughs> and old people that have done maybe more athletic karate as they get older they're going to get a bit more into karate history or karate mm. chapter or you know they get they've all, all martial arts and combat sports they've got a natural life cycle that you can fall into so it's a very good thing about the karate world is there's lots of strings to it so if you get to a point where you can't spar anymore you can't do something i can still be included in a class because we mm. could do a kata class or we could do a you know, sanshin, breathing, class. there's always something you could do and be involved in. It might not be as martially effective anymore, but you can still do something. And that that's what martial arts is good for, is that there's a lot of ways you might move more into the weapon forms because the unarmed stuff just is too much for you now. But mm. you're still quite happy to maybe move a bow or a joe around or whatever you're into. Uh, so it's got good depth, I think. Things like karate have got really good. You can make it quite deep if you want to. Um, mm. And that's cool. I really, I really appreciate that. I think that's a, a nice thing to have, you know, the heritage to it, the culture. If you want to get good at things that are outside of normal fighting, you can. Sure. Uh, you know, it's a hobby, keeping you busy, keeping you out of trouble. So all good and positive. Yeah. Uh, uh, for me, the, the benefits of martial arts of all types for all people mm. is phenomenal. And I wouldn't hesitate to recommend it to anyone. You know, I think it is the instructor scene can be quite bitchy and backstabby. And you know? so like mm. martial artists at the upper level, I think is not particularly nice as a scene, but as mm. the kind of the amateur have a go, Thursday night at the Leisure Centre Martial Arts, you know, the big critical mass, the biomass there. I think that's so good for people, planet, society, keeping people connected, whether they're doing Tai Chi at seven in the morning or whether they do Aikido every second Wednesday at the local scout hall, whatever they're doing, mm. it's got so much power and I'll always back it and always love it. Um, and I think that's the important thing. Just don't lose the love of it and don't spend too much time just looking at your little pot. I mean, look around that big martial arts world and appreciate and steal stuff and learn from stuff. Even if you learn to avoid doing that kind of stuff in the future, mm. be uh, really, I use this phrase a lot for my business stuff. If you want to be interesting, be interested. You know, mm. I'm not massively into ninja stuff, but I'll spend hours speaking to people that do ninjutsu. I'm like, oh, cool. How'd you do it? What'd you do? How'd how you format your, your classes? Mm. What that's about? You know, if you want to be an interesting instructor, you've got to be interested in that entire martial arts world if you can and stay as interested and happy and active as long as you can. Mm, very, very good advice. Um, I think next seminar we've got together, it's the Bunkai Bash, isn't it? And then you are um, doing a knife seminar for us. That's really personal for me to to learn different things. Uh, we done together with Tomek from Poland with Defendo. Mm -hmm. That was interesting for me because it was the first one when I looked in the knife. So I'm looking forward to learning from you and seeing your your style and um, choosing something that I can... Actually, my neighbor is going to do the, his is with a, a spear system and Krav Maga cool. um, lo locally. So we exchange over the, our fans um, ideas and stuff. And um, so he's going to do seminar as well. So that's going to be interesting for me. By yourself, you're every week somewhere, right? Yeah, pretty much every week. <laughs> I, um, and that's how I like it. You know, I'm, I'm, at the moment, I don't have kids. So I can, I can get away with being away and traveling and teaching and learning very often but what people don't see 
is that for every one thing I teach, I've probably attended two or three mm. things as a person, as a guest. Um, and so it, it is always a good reminder that you should always, if you're teaching a lot, take the time to be taught a lot too. If you can, if you can find a way, you get to stuff. But yeah, I'm I'm very, very busy with martial arts stuff, but it makes me happy. And that's what, those are the fond memories I've got. And I've got lots of great friends in martial arts that transcend martial artsy stuff. Mm. There's a lot of people I know that if I, if I was to ever become particularly ill or have a catastrophe in my life or something go wrong, you know, there's lots of people, even people that have never really known me that at a personal level, that would be a really good support network and that mm. would help me. And, and that's, a, that's a really nice, good feeling to have. It's a good part of our culture. And you only get that by being on the road and supporting people yourself if they've got mm. a charity seminar or they need some help or you know something's happened to their dojo, there's been a flood and all their pads have melted. You know, mm. being the person that likes, comments, shares, supports, you know, tells people off, gets people involved. You know, be, being involved in that community is, is really important and, and good. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can see how that works because we had a few common friends that had the misfortune of either parts being stolen, like in Paul's case, and, and you know, and setting that, you know, um, would you go fund me or something like that, you could see how many people actually not knowing other person, just knowing, oh, this is martial artist, needs, needs a help. I can spend, you know, pound, two pounds, ten pounds, whatever they can, and it changes people's life, right? Yeah, exactly. For for most people, you know, I'm fortunate that it's not. I'm more fortunate and unfortunate because I think it, it would be a lovely to do as a full time job, but then mm. would I think about it different and feel about it differently? Whereas for a lot of people that need support, that's the only thing they've got in the world. That's the thing that puts food in their fridge and lights in their house and a roof above their heads it keeps their children happy and healthy so like for those people especially you know we need to go the extra mile to to, to help those people out um if that's their only source of income then you know, they're a really big priority to help keep them up and running and going and doing stuff but i'd say it's a pretty good community for fundraising support share as much as we all tend to bitch about each other. We also tend to help each other when people are having mm. a bad time. Um, I've seen lots of really good things happen because mm -hmm. people pull together. And like you said, donate their time or their interest or their energy or their teaching or whatever, whatever they can do. You know, if mm. you go right now, if someone on Facebook said, I've had all my pads stolen, immediately within a day, there'd be a hundred people saying, I've got some spares. I can give you some. Yeah. I know a supplier that can do something for you straight away without mm. question most people would be in there helping and that that's lovely to see are you uh, ch changing slightly the subject are you writing anything new book you've got successful so, books out so yeah I'm, I'm i love writing my books uh i'm writing a book right now which is difficult for me because i've t i've made three technique orientated books mm. And people always say, this one always makes me laugh. This is another martial arts catches them. I don't teach techniques. I teach principles. Mm. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Shut up. Like, I mean, like, you know, I always struggle because I hear that a lot. And I'm thinking, okay, so I need to find some principles. And I, I struggle to fit principles into what I'm teaching. Yeah, exactly. So I, I kind of doing a disservice to myself trying to find okay i need to try the concepts because i don't really understand what they mean by concepts the yeah concept it's a, to punch him in the face it's a, just another stupid thing that makes you sound clever i don't teach techniques anymore i teach principles yeah but those principles are only useful if you got techniques haven't they if your principle is push and pull you know, when they push you pull okay that, that might be a principle but unless I know how to turn that into a throw, a clinch and a hit, it's a useless piece of data. <laughs> it's, a, it's a useless data. Uh, but as an aside, so you know, there's things like that flying around. So my latest book that I'm working on is about teaching, setting drills, running seminars, 
it's that kind of stuff so it's going to be hardly any techniques in it it's going to be things you can do to invent and make and work with different learning styles to create different drills and how to run good seminars and good classes where the energy is high so it's going to be those types of things pre-booked one please because <laughs> there's, there's, there's nothing on it right now if you were to go on amazon you've got technique ones like my books mm. or you've got blah 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 ones which are like soft skills 900 soft skills for angry accountants and there's not much in the middle of those two worlds mm. whacking people and boring them to death I, I want this book to be somewhere in the middle uh where it's if because a lot of people they've been teaching in their club they've been teaching there for 10 years they don't go to many other things and there's no real way for them to get more data outside mm. of scrolling through youtube so my book will be about how to invent your own drills, play with stuff, how to research stuff. You know, like I said at the start, start one class today where we all walk outside for half an hour. Mm -hmm. Just have, you know, you might think, oh, well, I've heard of that before. But unless you've got a book saying, right, I'm going to give you 30 weeks of interesting stuff. And week 17 is bring them in, and then tell them to put their clothes back on and do this. It gives them, mm -hmm. gives you things to do. Yep. Having things to do with your students that are fun and interesting, weird, different, but valuable, that's there's nothing really out there for that. So that's what I'm that's what I'm working on right now. But they're harder to write because the technique ones are technique A, do this, 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 technique B, this, this, this. Whereas these kind of books about drills and energy management, they're harder to write in an entertaining and short form, mm. but they're that's my challenge, and uh, I think people will like it. I think people will enjoy it, and it's what I'm known for as well. Like that, outside of any technique -y stuff, whether it's chin jab, right cross, whatever, whatever it is, really, why people will come and travel is because you're going to get taught something in an interesting way, in a passionate format. That whether you go back and do Wing Chun, Lao Ga, Karate, or Krav Maga, you can still take the drill that I've given you and use it. Um, you know, and uh, a lot of people are quite open to oh, I like that, that, and that. I'm going to take that and use it. Um, so yeah, that's 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 the next book that I'm working on. Probably out quarter four this year, so December time. But I'm notorious for saying it's going to be out, and then it's actually out five months afterwards. But yeah, it it is difficult. I've got the same with my books. It's it's always plus. You know, you 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 got good English. And my books are written in Pinglish, as my wife says, then she has to look at it and he, she's very busy with work. So it always takes ages for her to. So I'm writing books very quickly, just uh, making the sense of them in English. It takes longer. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I encourage everybody to write a book. and I'm sure you'd be the same. Mm. Two, there's a, there's a really good African proverb. And it's, uh, when, a, when an old man dies, a library burns. Mm. And yeah, there is so many brilliant martial arts instructors that teach in a scout hut in Wigan to seven people. And when they die, every good thing they ever taught will probably die with them. Mm. And that's really sad. And it's like, I, I think everybody in martial arts that's instructing has got at least one book in them. Mm. Sadly, for traditional arts, there is a really big... Who am I, a lowly, a lowly third Dan, to make a book when Super Sheehan Ninth Dan, they've made theirs? You know, who am I to speak on behalf of Uchi Ryu Karate or Lao Ga Kung Fu when there's Master Wong from Hong Kong that's done it since he was three? You know, people that are, well, who am I? There's, there's, there's probably too much humility in there. And it's like, who are you? You're a person that's been teaching this to people for over 40 years you know, and you will have proved drills and stories and content that might not be anywhere else in the world and you are one badly formatted published book away from sharing it with people you need to be a brilliant amazing book but you get something out there get a blog out there get a youtube if you can't make a book make a youtube channel even if there's no one on it it's just having that record of you in space and time Mm. It's important. Um, that's why I always insist on my books as well as my YouTube. I know that maybe in 20 years, YouTube won't exist anymore and it'll be something else. 
But I know that those books will be somewhere on someone's shelf. And I know this, I buy books that are hundreds of years old <laughs> about boxing and wrestling and fencing. So, you know, making some physical media is important. So I think you know, books and digital platforms together, it's a really good combination. But every good martial arts instructor has at least got one in them if they're brave enough to put it out there. And they should not listen to the inner demon of who am I to be doing this? Yeah, yeah I can attest that because I've been suffering with that for a long time. And when you overcome it once and have a positive feedback from the other people, it's really encouraging to do stuff. And now I think my old karate friends have enough of me because when I start talking, oh, that's interesting. You should write a book about it. It's like, when are you going to write your book about it? Oh, just leave me alone. I don't want to write books. But you should. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's good. You know, like, I think that's why your anxious black belt format works. You're never going to get anxious Masayama, are you? Like, mm. all of the karate heroes are shrouded in a fictional story of I'm chopping bulls and I'm fighting hundred men and I'm living under a mm. waterfall and I only eat moss. And, you know, like, they, they're, <laughs> like they're just, they're, they've become a manga, they've become a story, they've become a Superman. And that has benefits because having heroes that are really good at stuff is cool, you know? If, if, if that, I saw Masayama did that hundred man kumite, I want to do a hundred man kumite, that's cool. Mm. But you should also role model just being a normal human being that's got mm. worries and anxieties and fears and hopes and someone that learns, you know, in the, let's take Masayama again, in the, in the story, the novel of Masayama, it, it doesn't really fail, does he? He doesn't really get knocked back. He doesn't think, shit, what if I can't fight 100 men at the same time? At no point will they talk about, crap, 100 men, I might get battered. <laughs> that's never, but, but your books can. Your books can say, I did that competition and I was terrified. That's real. Like, mm. Fighting is terrifying. Like I've got a low-level three-round match on Saturday. The odds are I'll probably win. But I'm still, I will still, Saturday morning, be absolutely in my mind like I'm about to go to war with a bear. Mm. Knowing full well that it's very unlikely I'll suffer any harm at all. But, you know, like, if you don't confess to people that you've got fears, anxieties, that you've got ego, you know, mm. things like this. Yeah, I'm well known for doing martial arts, combatives and self-defense. If I have a match and I lose horrendously, a portion of people that follow me will then not follow me. Mm. And, you know, the disease that you, and it would be awful to confess it, but it's true. You know, you, there's a fear of failing. There's a fear of pain and injury and death. All of these things are possible in that world and only real humans can feel those those fears and everybody has it. You know, so I think that's why your anxious black belt stuff is so good because you know your your Masayamas or your you know your all your different Okinawa master stories uh, very seldom do they go, I was terrified, I was a bit poorly, I'm not sure this will actually work. You know, they, they don't mm -hmm. they don't have those human traits that you can yeah. put on a page and in your podcast. Uh, so I, I think that's really good. And more martial artists should talk about the things they're scared of, that they're afraid of, that they're anxious about, that they're proud of, that they shouldn't be proud of. You know, there's, there's, mm. just, just put, your, put your humanity out on a page. Yeah, I've got a huge, um, huge, hugely positive feedback on, on when I teach seminars and more and more people booking me now, you know, can you do half an hour talk about your experiences in karate and you know your fears and stuff and it's a massive feedback in people crying and everything and i always taking it back you know it's just the story of me and it's so emotional for people because so many people going through exactly the same shit as i thought you know i thought i'm in a way special because i've got such a bad things and you know afraid of this but most of the people got exactly the same things you just don't realize that there's other people out there because you're so embarrassed to talk about it that you don't reach out to other people and say, oh, actually, that's pretty normal. You know, everybody's going and that, and we can gather up together and build ourselves up. Yeah, I mean, like, talking about failures, like, I when I had Joe Saunders come over for a seminar, I thought it would be a really big hit. And it mm. cost quite a lot of money to get Joe over. And I had, for two days, 
maybe seven to eight people and it got nowhere near to financially covering me mm. to get the flight sorted and the accommodation and all sorts of stuff and i had to take out from my credit card quite a lot of money and miss rent payments i've had seminars where i paid for loads of stuff but I'd hardly anyone turn up mm. and like it punches you right in the bollocks. When you set something up and you think it's going to be good and you know you're pretty good and then you get three people and one of them flakes anyway, mm. you know, that that possibly does you in. I've started clubs where they have not taken off. I've had maybe one person turn up consistently like, I'm so sorry to let you down, but I can't run a club on one mm. person and the guy that comes one in every two sessions. And it's heartbreaking. The amount of seminars I've set up, the failed classes set up, failed. Uh, people think that the more well-known you get, it's guaranteed. Mm. But I could set up three seminars and have 50 people, 50 people, two people. And there is no rhyme or reason for that to happen. But people don't appreciate how upsetting, expensive, heartbreaking it is to mm. organise things, run things, and have no fuckers turn up. Um, yeah, I'm, so it's I'm, good to I'm, talk I'm, about. I'm expecting that happened to me this June. We've got Ken Knight coming from States. I won't say how much it is, but it's gonna bankrupt me. But if, at the moment, we've got two people. So many people saying, "Yeah, we want it, we want it," and you're going and Christian coming from Germany as well, and it's two people registered. But hey, how that's life. You win some, you lose some. Yeah, but you got to talk about it because there's so many people out there that mm. are just like that's their horrifying experience. Mm. Uh, but we've all been there we've all been there where you've taken a chance gone with an instructor you thought would be popular isn't popular you know no fault of their own and your own it's just mm. the, the gods have decided that that weekend there are seven other seminars on and your yeah. regulars are poorly and any number of reasons um but that's that's just that's just a normal part of how we, we go about our trade isn't it sometimes yeah. You think there's going to be 10 and there's like 40 people. You're like, fuck, you know, what's happened here? Mm. <laughs> um, but not enough people talk about the loss and the fear it is to host and do stuff. Mm. Easy to attend or to be a guest instructor at someone else's thing. It's a lot more terrifying for it to come out of your wallet and your time mm. and it'd be your effort. So, yeah, you know, anyone that ever hosts me at a seminar, um, you know, I really do acknowledge that that is a that is a risk for them, and so I will go up my way to try and promote it and talk about it and share it. Um, but yeah, it's it's an important thing. That's why I think your anxious podcast is good because it could address things like that. Mm. You know, I'm afraid to put on this seminar. I'm worried that I'll have to close my class. You know, I'm feeling sad because people have been a dick to me online about my stuff. It's good to mm. talk about that stuff because we've all been there. You know, I make jokes about trolls as much as everyone else, but there are mm. some times the trolls get me, and I'm like, oh, you bastard, I feel really shit. Yep. Yeah. We all get it. It, it is difficult. It, it sometimes, you know, you can have as thin skin as you can, but somebody hits you in that pore and goes through like butter and just like, oh. uh, for me, the worst thing is when people commenting about me, I'm not, not having a problem. But if I do seminars or somebody picks on somebody else, that hurts a lot. You know, it's just like you're picking on somebody who is 60 years old because he didn't do a spinning back kick properly. Oh, fuck off. Really? But it, that gets me. That gets me a lot. And so when you got when you got your um, into seminars, how long did you take you of failure to actually make a breakthrough? Because I've got a lot of questions now when I'm sort of popular. A lot of people, I think, because I'm not as popular as Ian or other people, um, reaching out to me and asking, oh, how did you start it? What did you do? How long did it take you? How did you set it up? And, you know, if you tell them, sorry, it's seven years of being a one person or maybe two people turning up, forming a club, you know, you pay for a whole, like you said, it's expensive and so on. But just that being stubborn bastard who doesn't give up eventually pays off. How, did, how was it for you, that journey? Yeah, there's no magic trick. It is do stuff often and if you are good eventually people will talk to other people you know the best networking is word of mouth 
Mm. So they'll be like, oh, I went to that Les Bubka thing. That was really good. Do you want to come with me? Yeah, all right. I'll go to the Les Bubka thing. And then you got two people saying, I quite mm. like the Les Bubka thing. I'm going to, you know, and that takes, that takes huge amounts of time to build up. So I don't know if you're, are you familiar with the Kaizen events at all? Yes. Yeah. So the Kaizen events are like one of the UK's biggest martial arts shows. And I went to Kaizen one and I was one of the instructors there and I had, three people turn up and I was in some back room somewhere. One of them was Paul. You know, I was talking about earlier. It's Paul, Paul and his wife came to, came to my mat. And I really appreciate them for that. Uh, there's even pictures of me on my lonely mat with, <laughs> with Paul and Sam. And then the second year, I had a slightly better slot and I had about 10 people come. And then each iteration since, I've been on the main stage, on the main mats, you know, next to really famous people. <laughs> like, like really people that are really too good to be teaching on the same mat as me. Um, so it just takes time. If people like you, they will come and they will talk to others and that will multiply. I think one of, if people wanted to hack it in a way, my advice would be find a popular instructor and teach a small thing at a seminar where there's lots of people. So mm. if you can black yourself 20 minutes at an Ian Abernethy seminar, you've at least shown what you've got or a flavour of what you've got to perhaps 80 people. Yeah? Mm. And that might be the thing that builds your reputation. But really, I would say there's no shortcuts. It's mm. constant grind. And at any point, you can go from very popular to very unpopular again. Mm. It, it's not consistent and people sometimes think they've completed you so i i get this a lot they go ah well i've done your world war ii seminar and i've done your boxing for self-defense seminar so i have completed 100 percent the tommy moore program you know and you might say the same say in karate like someone might say ah well i've done your motobu drills seminar and i've done your Naihanshi Bunkai seminar. See, I know karate words, right? You know, people, <laughs> whatever you're famous for, people can think they've completed it. And then you don't get booked again. And you're like, so you think the two four hour segments you had with me is everything I've got in the world to teach you? You're having a laugh. Uh, but it, it does, people do that. People look at an instructor, have them teach their most famous thing, and perceive that as a book. So it's a, probably another reminder for instructors that are watching this that you might be on a wave of popularity now, mm. but just as quickly, you could disappear. So don't, don't rest on those laws. Just keep doing it. It will wave up and down. You will have lots and none and lots and none and lots and none. And that's absolutely okay as long as you're happy. As long as you're happy and as long as you're not being out of pocket then that's okay. You, you try and fail and try and fail. There are a lot of people that just get sell out a seminar by default, straight away. And there are some, it takes time. Um, and that will that will chop and change. It's not like I'm teaching my first seminar with Ian, but my audiences and Ian's audiences, those are, those are probably quite different. So that'll be an interesting seminar because the, there'll be different tribes of people that, that sm there's some people in the middle but there's also two different tribes, which is very interesting. He's obviously a very, very popular instructor. Um, so it'd be cool to see how things like that work. But it's terrifying and daunting, and you will have really good seminars and really shit seminars. And some of my favourite seminars have been where I've had five people, and it's been a complete financial washout. But all five people have really valued the fact that I go there. You know, I travel a lot. I travel, I'll travel to Bumfuck Nowhere in Cumbria to mm. teach a seminar at a small club, knowing full well that the cost of my petrol will be more than whatever they pay me. Mm. But I'll still go there. You know, I can't do it all the time, but if I can and I can afford it, I'll help people out. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think there's any secret. There's no way, quick way to get popular. All you can do is be authentically you. And if you are good, and you might not be as good as you think you are, but if you are good, people will talk about it and they'll book you more. And most bookings you'll get will be, I went to your seminar at Bunkai Bastards. I really liked you. Would you teach at my club? You know, yeah. that 
that's how it's going to be. And because you can only do so many of those things in a year, it takes years to build mm. up a decent reputation that you can comfortably say, I'll get 30 people at that seminar. Yeah, it takes years and years and years. Um, yeah, that's that's what I done. Exactly what you said. I, I team up. With, I've been fortunate that quite famous people in UK like Ian, uh, Don, Brian Bates, and and people who organize things, been kind enough to me to allow me either to book them, as we both together teaching, and share the space with me. And and yeah, it, it's it's kind of keep rolling, right? You invite them, they invite you. And we all can build each other up, and 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 that was the way that I I tried on my own, and failed for many years in having you know two three people on the same thing as mostly people from my club, um. But then if you start believing in yourself and not putting yourself down, the things that feel things start happening, right? I think uh, Mark Jardine said to me once that you have to keep going, push it that ball on the hill. And eventually it's gonna tip over that peak and then start rolling down and it's gonna be dragging you with it with it. So I, I firmly believe that's what it is. You just have to put the effort in it and don't be discouraged and, and eventually you get there. I also think what really helps because people listening, people listening this far in there, they've they've gone the extra mile, but the people are still tuned in. What they should remember is make it easy to be a product. Well, a lot of people that won't ask you to be a seminar because they're worried you might be expensive mm. or they're worried you might not travel. So try and be really transparent and open. You know, uh, Steve Lowe is really good. Steve Lowe's like, whatever you charge, I'll take half. So mm. if you charge 50 pounds, I'll take 25. If you charge 10, I'll take five. You know, it's a really open, transparent model. So if you set, if you're very clear and open with things like pricing and travel and availability, it feels awkward to talk about. But it gets rid of that initial fear. You know? mm. I'm a relatively popular instructor, and a lot of people would assume that I'm very expensive. I'm phenomenally cheap. If I if I let people pay at all, I'm ridiculous. Mm. But there's a perception that if you have pretty full mats, you're going to be, I want at least £1,500, travel expenses, I want this, I want that, you know, I want half an advance. Ugh. Most people are so reasonable. you just got to mm. ask. And your idea of what they cost and what they really cost is often very different. And don't forget to haggle as well. You, know, you, you can haggle and talk about mm. pricing. Payment plans, you know, like, okay, I'll come to you. It'll cost this, but you can pay it over three months if you like. You know, like there's, there's ways in which you can negotiate. Uh, so you don't treat martial arts as any different from buying a car, going shopping. It's not really. Or working with a freelance artist. It's, you mm. know, like how but you can help yourself get more bookings by making it really clear what you charge, how to book you, where to book you, where you've got gaps. That really does work in your favor. Oh, it does. You're right. Because every time I post uh, my schedule, there's somebody asking, oh, could you do this? Could you do that? And 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 yeah, yeah, you know, you just ask if, if you are up front, if you want to organize a seminar and you're up front, listen my customers are my my students are not from the rich backgrounds i think everybody's gonna do concession you know just you know talk to me and then we can figure out the way i want to teach you want to have me sure i need to pay the bills but we can find the way that it works for both of us so i think we, i done that with um uh perry monsfield yeah in saving the judo club so i give him a charge it wasn't very much. It covered my petrol, covered my time, and he made three times more to put into the judo judo session because so many people came in to support that rescue of that judo club. Which I hope it's all good because that was after COVID, so they had a huge um, hitting bill and they needed like eight hundred, nine hundred pounds, and we managed to raise it. Absolutely. I think nearly. So, you know, speak to people from my point of view, speak to people. We are trying to help each other. So there is a room for a uh, negotiations and, and having a good deal. Yeah. Don't guess, just ask. Just mm. most people are very polite, very, even if it's I'm too booked or I can't do it for less than that. At least you know where you stand. You might as well, you know, get, just ask. Mm. Uh, but my experience, most martial artists that are good and kind and decent 
won't trust you the earth and will negotiate and meet you in the middle. Um, mm. And you should say, look, I live in this part of the world. I can only get X amount of people. So this is where I'm, I'm at. What could we do for that? Could we do, could you still come, but we teach for fewer hours? Uh, you know, could you bring stuff to sell once you're there? What can, what can we do? You know, that's, mm. uh, those conversations are good to have, but if you want to get booked, make it very clear and transparent as to what you can do and how you can work. I think that will help. That's something I didn't do for a while. And a lot of people assumed I was expensive because mm. they never asked. Um, mm. But now people, a lot of people have the courage. And because I'm quite a social person, you can always find me online. Mm. Most people are now quite happy and understand that I'll have really open conversations. So yeah, just be open. Just always, mm. always be open and clear. But I'd say there's very few shortcuts to being seminar seminar famous i suppose if you, if you get booked a lot there is there is no shortcut to it other than do them often be good and if you're as good as you think you are we will book you again and again and they'll book you repeat you know when you're doing well when you get repeat bookings every year with the same club. that's when you know you you're actually moving in the right direction i, I would rather do a seminar a year for a club I like, then lots of different clubs. You know, that shows me that they valued the first one and we'll do more. And I think you know, that's, that's a good place to be. Mm. And I would say that would like, like, like the, I was talking with Christian about, I always have a fear of asking people for that refusal and stuff. And he said, three things can happen. People can say no, fuck no, or yes. Yeah. But if you don't ask, you will never know. Yeah. so so yeah exactly right thank you tommy uh, i think we're going to finish on this one ask and then you will have your answer um, absolutely thank you very much it's always a pleasure to talk to you um i don't think so we need to put your where to find you you over everywhere on all the platforms i'm going to put the links to your stuff in the show notes uh, awesome. and i'm going to see you on the floors in very short time in june isn't it yeah, June, mate. I'll see you there. Last time I talked there, I remember my voice had gone to it. It was my first Bunko Bash, and I could not make an audible sound. So mm. that's the thing you need to be ready for as an instructor. No matter what you do and how much you prep, something's going to get you. <laughs> so you. You're ready for anything. But I'll see you if there. You, but... if, if you lose your voice, I've got uh, my son coming with me who's got a uh, 96, 98 decibel voice, so he can shout for you. Good man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers, buddy. Bye -bye. Let me just switch that off.